Hello, and welcome back to a series I'm doing in real and complex analysis. Today we're going to be working with a problem which was actually suggested to us, and it's about the limit of LP norms. So let's dive right in. So we have the kind of typical setup. We have x mu as a measure space. In particular, x could be the real numbers. Mu could be the Lebesgue measure, if you like that. Um, and we also have that f is both an LR and an L infinity function. I'm just writing that as it's in the intersection of the two. So just to remind you, LR function means that the R norm of f uh, is finite. Uh, or, you know, just to remind you even further, uh, the R norm, we'll write it like this. It's just the absolute value of f raised to the rth power d mu, and then we take the fractional power 1 over r of that. Um, substantially different is the infinity norm. So uh, you may have heard uh, the L infinity norm, or you may just you know remind yourself by saying, oh, well, it's the essential supremum. Uh, those are both fine, uh, but we'll just take it to mean uh, that it's the smallest uh, a such that this set, so all the members of x, for which the absolute value f of x is larger than a has measure zero. Has measure zero. So like I said, that's also the essential supremum if you like that uh, better. So uh, just to, for, clar for further clarification, you know, r is between one and infinity, but in particular it's not infinity so that this, this statement on the left here is not really saying the same thing twice. And our goal here is to prove a limit of LP norms. So namely, it's to prove this limit here. Uh, the limit as you know, P goes to infinity of these uh, uh, P norms of F actually approaches the essential supremum of F. Okay, so a priori, we don't even really know that this limit on the left exists. And because of that, we might be thinking that maybe the best way to do this is to kind of prove a two-sided inequality and pass kind of uh, the lim inf or the lim sup uh, of this F, FP norm, and then maybe we can get to uh, an equality, and we can show that this limit exists by showing that equality. Okay, so the first thing I kind of want to uh, remind everyone of is the basic holder inequality. You may have seen generalizations of this, but really the most basic version that I've seen is you know where you have two functions, uh, they're defined on this measure space X, they're complex valued, or they're even just real valued, and you, the one norm is bounded above by the P and Q norm, where P and Q are conjugate pairs. And what I mean by that is P and Q satisfy this weird relationship here. Um, cool. And in particular, for our problem, we allow P and Q to be 1 and infinity. And the proof of that is a little bit different than the proof of the, the actual holder inequality, but it's, it's not too hard to see. So in our original problem, you know, we, we have F as an LR function but we really only care about the behavior of, of P as it gets really, really large, ra namely the asymptotic behavior. So let's just pretend P is much larger than R, just for our convenience, cool. And let's take a look at the hint I left myself, which is to look at the P norm of F raised to the P power. So let's rewrite this maybe in terms of R a little bit. So we get FR, FP minus R, and then it's, uh, just the one norm raised to the pth power. Um, well, so we have one over p, and then so actually no, so that is actually canceled because if we if we write this all out, really what I'm saying is this, uh, which is then equal to f to the r, f to the p minus r, d mu, uh, but this. This, it's, it's raised to the pth power here, so that fractional power is gone, which means that there's just a one outside, and so it's really just uh, what I wrote above here. So I'm kind of writing myself in circles, but just to kind of clarify what I meant by those moving that, that uh, norm notation around. So now we have something we could maybe use holder with. So let's go ahead and do that, and let's pass infinity to the p minus r power. So f... Uh, to p minus r, infinity, and let's pass uh, um, 1 to the r power. So r and 1. And now we can take both sides to the power 1 over p, 
and see what happens. So we get the p norm of f is bounded above by, and let's just bring those powers out, p minus r, that quantity over p, still the, the L infinity norm. And then on the right, we have to the r over p and 1. Okay, so we're almost there, um, but let's take the uh, limb soup of both sides as p goes to infinity. And the reason we can take the limb soup, well, the reason we can't take the limit, again, is because we don't necessarily know that this limit of the p norms even exists. But we do know that we have a limb soup. Um, and in fact, just all we're really doing is that little analysis trick where we're just passing the limit. So in other words, we get that the limb soup p approaches infinity of f of p is bounded above by Okay, well, what on the, the right side, what's happening? So let's return to the right side here. What's happening? As P goes to infinity here, this fraction goes to zero, which means this quantity goes to one. And on the left side, we have P minus R over P. Well, R is just some number, so this quantity is actually going to one, which means that the right side, as we apply the limit, is really just the L infinity norm of F. So we've gotten essentially what, what we wanted in one direction. And the other direction is the, the direction that actually gave me some trouble and then I kind of had to remember um, just how to really think about this stuff. And in particular, we kind of do it using a clever epsilon argument. And it involves this set which I'm calling A epsilon. So A epsilon is just going to be the values of X where f of x is within epsilon of its L infinity norm. So we can vary epsilon however we want, and correspondingly a epsilon will vary, but the crucial thing here is that a epsilon, we can, or rather we can choose epsilon such that a epsilon is finite. And let's go ahead and do that. And if you think about it, the reason we can choose a epsilon, uh, or epsilon such that a epsilon is, has finite measure um, is because if we couldn't do that, then that would mean that this function could not be uh, LR in particular, right? Because we would always be within some uh, positive number, uh, within epsilon of some positive number, the L infinity norm, right? And that would mean that uh, we would have uh, infinite measure to deal with uh, over a quantity which is positive. So, you know, our we would have a contradiction there. I'm not going to write that all out, but that's kind of the, the quick spark notes version of why this set has finite measure. Um, and the hint I gave myself is look at uh, F times this indicator function one a epsilon P. So in particular, we want to notice that, you know, the, the whole entire P norm is going to be larger than kind of this restricted P norm where we're just looking at uh, a epsilon P. Um, so let's write that out. What, is, what does that really mean? It means that we're restricting ourselves to the set A epsilon. We're taking the pth power of F, and then we're taking the fractional power of that. But we know something about uh, F on A epsilon. Namely, we know by definition that F is larger than, again, I'll underline it up here, the L infinity norm minus epsilon. So let's write uh, our inequality there and work through that. So on A epsilon, we know that F is larger than this quantity, which is the L infinity norm of F minus epsilon. We'll take it to the pth power. And I forgot my d mu, but then we have the fractional power again, uh, one over P on the outside there. So we're almost done. Um, and the thing I, you need to realize at this point is that uh, the L infinity norm of F minus epsilon is just a number. And it doesn't depend on x in any way. So when we're uh, integrating with respect to mu, it's essentially just a constant. In fact, it is a constant. So let's bring it out and let's see what happens. So this thing on the right side, we bring it out, the L infinity norm, f minus epsilon uh, to the p. And we also 
have to contend with the 1 over p power, so those cancel, times the integral uh, over a epsilon d mu to the 1 over p. So we're getting pretty close. Um, but this quantity, this is just the measure of a epsilon to the 1 over p. But I said that this quantity is finite. So in other words, we can do a similar trick that we did the first time, except instead of passing the lim sup, we can pass the lim inf. So this chain of inequalities that we've just written tells us that the lim inf, as p goes to infinity of these fps, is always larger than, or at least equal to, this uh, L infinity norm of f minus epsilon. But epsilon is a quantity that we can vary. Um, and in particular, that means we can just send epsilon to zero. Um, so as epsilon approaches zero, we get the following thing which we wanted all along. We recover back this inequality. But we know that the lim inf of the fp norms is greater than or equal to the supremum norm of f. And by the first inequality, we know that the lim sup of the fp norms is less than or equal to the supremum norm of f. So combining these two inequalities, we get our desired result, which is the limit as p approaches infinity of the fp norms, or the, the lp norms of f, is equal to the supremum norm of f.